a pleasure to be here with you, uh, even though virtually. Um, the yeah, let me see if I can move slides. Okay, the original yeah. plan, of course, was to travel from Brno to Alicante to be physically there with you. But what has happened, you know, is this uh, compression of, uh, of, of, of spaces. Um, we go to conferences to be physically together, but maybe we have just realized, you know, over the past couple of years, uh, you know, the ultimate shift uh, since, uh, you know, we're not sharing just time, but also uh, space virtually. Uh, now, my talk is going to be about uh, these, these issues, about these, these transformations. Um, and uh, in, in relation to uh, this the key notion is really the word transformation um, and change. And um, uh, this will be wrapped up uh, in the notion of, uh, of time. Um, my talk is uh, structured roughly into four parts. Uh, in the first part, um, I want to uh, arrive at a working definition of, of genre. Um, uh, since uh, I know that here at NSA Text Talks, uh, you know, people are uh, working on various kinds of material, legal, uh, language, uh, academic, uh, English, um, and so on. Um, but genre is one of the things that connects us. So I'd like to uh, point, uh, point out some, some of the connecting issues here. Um, then the transformations in connection with uh, the news genre, right? How news have been changing throughout history and what is the conception of the news event? Um, in the in the next part, uh, I'll uh, move to the transformation of news in the internet age, and I'll point out uh, some of the effects of uh, liveness, uh, the live uh, coverage uh, of events, and finally, uh, since I'm a linguist, I have to um, mention some uh, micro-level linguistic features um, in the uh, in the final part. Now. Understanding genre as a, as a textual question. Um, these days, uh, the Guardian newspaper is celebrating 200 years of its uh, establishment and, and 200 years of coverage. Um, just last week, uh, I opened the newspaper and this came up at the top of the article, uh, right? The, the headline was buried deep below these pictures and I was wondering what's going on here. Um, I couldn't really guess it from uh, the, uh, the the photographs, um, but uh, it's clear uh, when I scroll down that this is a sort of a self-reflection article uh, about uh, style, about newsroom style, understood as uh, uh, the clothing that journalists uh, wear uh, in uh, when going about the duties of their of their profession. Um, I thought about that, uh, uh, for, not that I would be interested in, in, in fashion much, but um, read it on a Saturday morning, and I thought, well, this sort of gives us an interesting metaphor for change that could be applicable in some sense to our situation as uh, as scholars concerned with uh, with language, right? Of course, it's not just text that gets transformed. All kinds of other things like dress codes. Um, I've collated some of the uh, uh, comments and observations or suggestions uh, from current and past journalists of The Guardian in this newspaper uh, concerning clothing, right? Now, in the 1980s, you know, Patrick Bintour says what the code was then. And the current journalist, Paul Lewis, says versatility is the key because you don't know where you might be sent up. Um, and of course, uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, be noticeable in terms of how you dress, right? So you should kind of blend in with your, uh, with your surroundings. Uh, you want to look uh, you know, nice, approachable, but not fully confident. Um, another uh, uh, journalist here who covers the, the royal family and who provided that she has three hats uh, uh, to wear on different occasions or different occasions, um, pointed out that uh, you know you don't uh, you, you're not there to upset people. It's, it's your it's your job. Um, and interestingly, she points out rookie mistakes. Wearing heels is a rookie mistake. Don't wear them, right? And because you don't, and also you don't want to uh, stick out like a sore thumb. So, excuse me, Jan. Excuse me. Um, um, yes. Your voice is is is. 
not very clear when you move around a bit. So could you move closer to the mic to the mix so that we can? Okay, okay. I will, I will try to be sorry, talking sorry. <laughs> more loudly. Yes, it's picking out. Yes, no, now it's better. Yeah, okay. as you move, anyway. the, the, the voice is cranky. Okay, fine. Thank you. Sorry about that connection. Now, what this uh, sums up uh, in terms of our concerns, um, I aligned these, these concepts uh, aside uh, next to the relevant comments, codes and norms, uh, issues of change, universality, natural, naturalness, natural uh, delivery, uh, the focus on referentiality, so to say, in terms of looking normal, usual, not on uh, sort of poetics, not of showing off uh, your dress or your verbal skills. There should be no self-expression. Um, I think there's also the dimension of the novice versus expert. The novice has to learn the conventions of the of the trade. Um, in our case, the textual conventions, for instance, of how to write a news article, how to write uh, an academic text. Um, and you need to blend in. Um, a couple of other uh, commentators here um, uh, have mentioned uh, something that could be labeled as house style. The Guardian has its own house house style. You can recognize people, um, even though there's some individuality. Um, and Peter Beaumont, who is a war correspondent, um, actually says uh, you need to adopt local styles in order to be efficient. Uh, and in order to blend in. Uh, and I think this points out something that could be called a synchronic variability, right? So the different styles are there uh, at the same time. Uh, they exist as a multiplicity, as a, as a potential, but they can be uh, culturally uh, specific. And I think all of these are, are metaphors and all of these are relevant uh, to our understanding of genre. All of these, of course, uh, all of this points to the functional definition of genre, which is different from registers, holiday and registers, and uh, say, Biber's uh, text, uh, text types. Um, and um, I, I think many of us uh, would agree with John Swales's uh, canonical uh, definition of uh, uh, genre in non-linguistic terms. Uh, he very simply stated in the 90s that a genre is, uh, is uh, something that serves a, a particular purpose, something that is recognized as such by the community, and something that is uh, very simply has a name by that community. So the community identifies um, that uh, situational, that textual format as uh, uh, distinct from others. Now, Johnstone adds uh, that uh, genres are a recurrent verbal forms uh, associated with this purpose for activity. Uh, Fairclough very generally mentions that it's different ways of interacting discursively, which is not very helpful for us. Uh, but Euchre and Kopacik, uh, from historical, from a historical dramatic point of view, add that uh, you can't study uh, genres uh, in isolation from the community. You have to consider uh, the originators and the recipients. And that's something towards which I will be moving on uh, in the conclusion of my talk. Um, at the same time, Swales points out that genre is a kind of a prototype, uh, a prototype that is something that has a central realization, uh, but there are also peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, possibilities. Um, um, there are margins, there are issues on the margins. Um, and importantly, he says, genre is not rigid. So it's changeable, it's flexible, um, it's not set in stone. Uh, so what are the crucial uh, elements of uh, uh, genre? I really like uh, the uh, communicative definition provided by Ken Highland, um, for whom genres are recurrent uses of more or less conventionalized forms through which individuals develop relationships we have the communities, establish communities, and get things done using language. Right? Get things done is a colloquial way of stressing the purpose, right? that it's goal-oriented it's goal action. So it's instrumental, it's dynamic, it's conventional, but it can be individualized. It needs to be flexible because it needs to be open to change, 
And it's also socially constitutive because uh, uh, genres or through the re textual realizations of genres, uh, we establish uh, relations uh, between uh, people and community. Now that brings me uh, to the second part of my talk, and that is uh, transformations and news discourse. Now, uh, Alan Bell, uh, a famous sociolinguist and a news discourse analyst, uh, wrote an interesting study a few years ago, which he titled A Century of News Discourse. Uh, where he analyzed uh, Captain Scott's uh, ill-fated um, expedition to the South Pole. Uh, what you see on the right is um, a report in the New Zealand Herald about this incident. Um, it's what's immediately uh, evident here is the, is the fact that it consists of uh, multiple uh, headlines, uh, about 10 decks of headlines, what we call decks, decks of headlines. And it's actually these, these headlines themselves uh, that tell the entire story of what, uh, what happened, uh, happened here. Now, Bell's argument here, um, however, is partly concerned with the language form, with the transformation of the language form, but also with the fact how you know, the speed of coverage um, has changed over this century of news. Now, when Captain Scott, in 1912, in January, um, um, died on the expedition, the news of this incident actually was published only a year later, in February 19, 1913. So there was, no, there was no news, there was no way how the news uh, could reach um, a civilization. Right? Now he contrasts that with, uh, with, with a situation in 1958 when Sir Edmund Hillary, Hillary um, um, went on an expedition to the South Pole, and the news of that uh, achievement was published in the New Zealand Herald uh, on the next day. Um, and finally, uh, 40 years later on, in 1991, Sir Edmund Hillary's son uh, recreated the trip. He went to the South Pole again, and what happened? He was interviewed live on the TV evening news in New Zealand, right from the South Pole. Right? The technology was there suddenly to allow immediate, immediate transmission and immediate uh, connection to the studio. So what Bell is uh, uh, suggesting is that technology has uh, changed uh, the world. Yes, of course, when the technology, when new technologies uh, appear, um, we also have new media, new media genres, uh, which uh, react to the changed uh, social situation. And it's nothing new, right? The impact on, of technology on news has been there for the past um, 600 years or 550 years. But with the invention of the printing press, uh, which meant that, you know, newspapers could come into existence because you had means for mass reproducibility of material, um, then of course the 19th century, the telegraph and the telephone, you have uh, a chance for a non-physical transmission of information across large distances. Um, and uh, with radio broadcasts in the 1920s, uh, you already have live transmission. Um, finally, what we have seen in our life, lifetimes with the internet uh, is, uh, a situation of a time collapse, and uh, you know, given that we are virtually conferencing, also space collapse. So this this issue actually breaks down into a several. The first of these is the, the is the temporal transformation which has uh, occurred, which we have uh, witnessed, and uh, this. This means that time, time has time has shrunk. Time has uh, time has collapsed. Um, this has uh, important implications for news coverage, um, because uh, the, the the frequency with which uh, news is appearing and is mediated um, um, does uh, does not no longer follows any 
any publication deadlines. Um, it's uh, it's rolling coverage. It's uh, information is coming. Information is processed immediately, and it's uh, being sent out there uh, to uh, recipients, uh, to readers and the viewers and the audience. Now, the second issue, um, um, of course, is the issue of textual transformation, something that linguists have uh, concentrated on. Um, Bell uh, notes himself the, the fact how, you know, the multiple tech headlines gave, gave way to single, uh, single headlines uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, other scholars have looked at the development of the inverted pyramid, uh, for example. Uh, that is the, the typical structural feature of, of news articles, which wasn't there in the 19th century. Um, and uh, one of the uh, explanations given is that this, uh, this, uh, this structure uh, may have been, um, um, may have come into existence as, as a result of pressures of uh, to communicate information via, via telegraph quickly at the, at the, at the beginning. Um, the inverted pyramid simply means that you're getting all of the important information at the top of the article in the first uh, part, of what you call the lead. And then fur further on as you go, you are getting more and more background information that could be omitted and very often was uh, for reasons of space by the types that they knew that they, they could cut from the bottom, but they, they couldn't cut from the top. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of the news story, that is what kind of a cognitive structure a news article uh, can be broken down upon and how the individual elements uh, that constitute a news event um, are covered. That's another focus of, um, say, diachronic linguistic analysis uh, um, in the area of the transformation of, of news. Um, the third issue uh, here is not just transformation, but it's emergence, it's textual emergence, the emergence of new uh, phenomena, of new texts, uh, new text types or new genres. Right? Um, we saw that, for instance, in the 19th century with the emergence of sports reporting, uh, when sports became institutionalized um, and uh, when uh, sporting results started to be covered in uh, Victorian newspapers. Uh, the, um, um, the journalists were in search of how to, in search of structures, how to go about that, breaking into um, unexpected, um, unknown, un unknown ground. Um, I've put down this note in 2021, right? We have uh, maybe another uh, interesting textual emergence, and that is uh, a pre recorded conference presentation. Um, I was uh, uh, meant to um, participate in the Sociolinguistic Symposium in Hong Kong in June, and all throughout the spring, um, calls were coming from the organizers. You can upload your presentation, or you have to upload your presentation in time, and it must be 20 minutes long. Um, and when you upload it, you will be able to view, watch all of the other people's presentations. Um, and so that's a, that's a new that's a new phenomenon, right? For uh, for us uh, now, what does that what does that mean? What does that imply? What is a conference presentation? We may have to rethink it. Rethink it, right? Is it just for the presentation of information, or is this more about the interaction and meeting people? And how do we handle these new challenges in the online world? So it's just a little little detour here. Um, now, uh, another issue concerning uh, time and the event uh, is when does actually an event become, become news? Um, you have situations when the information is known um, and it just travels, right? Uh, and once it reaches its destination, you know, the news can be spread out. So uh, the transmission takes, takes time. The classic example here is uh, uh, the marathon runner, uh, Pedipides, right, who's bringing uh, the news of the Greek victory uh, over, over the Persians. Um, smoke signals do this over the distance, right? Um, but now in the stage of instant mediation. Um, 
in connection with what Bell uh, is talking about, the, the South Pole um, incident and the one year lag in the coverage of that news, uh, news event uh, be before it was known. Um, what is this Ötzi? Uh, that's the Tyrolean Iceman uh, who was found in the 90s uh, in the Alps. Um, and he sort of embodies this situation. When the information is not known and it does not travel, um, there is no news, right? Uh, so if if, uh, if um, a volcano blows up on an isolated island in the middle of, of the Pacific and nobody knows about that, it's it's not news. It becomes news only only upon knowing and only upon becoming uh, significant, right? Uh, and this is the sort of the situation that we are accustomed to with living. We know that archives, for instance, are, are closed and they will open up uh, with concerning some events in 2050. Um, we also are familiar about, uh, you know, former politicians reflecting on their careers. Uh, so things that are relevant now will emerge uh, 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 later on. And, you know, metaphorically, you could say when ice melts, information emerges and then it becomes the news. Now, this leads us to uh, uh, the identification of three key situations or frames, we could term them deictic centers or participation frameworks even. And this is uh, the situation of the event, the situation of the news story and news reception. These three are temporally sequenced situations. So the event typically occurs at some time prior to its coverage, verbalization in the form of a news story. This is the second time. and uh, then the uh, the reader of the newspaper uh, reads um, the evening newspaper or reads about it the next day. This, of course, uh, uh, was the uh, traditional pattern for centuries until uh, until um, live live coverage. Now, the journalistic ideal here was um, and has always been uh, to bring current, recent, and topical uh, news. That is to get as close to the event as possible, because you don't want to um, cover stale news, something that is that is old. Now, this the the the, the journalistic ideal is met, met, uh, met um, in um, cases of liveness, in cases of live live broadcasts and live live texts. Um, this uh, means uh, that um, we actually get uh, something that could be called a triple deictic center simultaneity. We have these three uh, time zones which um, merge into a single one. Uh, so the event is happening and at the same time the text is being produced and at the same time the text is being received as long as it's uh, felicitous um, uh, reception, as long as you're not watching just a replay of a live broadcast uh, that was shown on uh, yesterday's, uh, yesterday's news. Uh, of course, this has been with us uh, for quite some time. Um, the first live broadcasts by radio uh, were done as early as the 1920s. Um, but um, this is the spoken mode where, um, a speech um, is produced and disappears. So speech, if it's not preserved, uh, right, needs um, um, processing in real time. Uh, and you can end up with this time, this kind of um, time, time confluence, time coexistence. In the written mode, however, um, because the written mode is preservable, and speak to the eye, not to the ear. ear. Um, this would not apply until the 2000s. And this is where I'm getting getting to later on. Um, also, you know, uh, another thing concerning Bell is um, that we might be privileging the, um, the effect of modern uh, technology on the speed of uh, uh, news coverage, maybe too much. Now, 
this image shows a catastrophe that everybody is familiar with. This is the Titanic that sank in um, 1912. Interestingly enough, it's the same year as the expedition to the South Pole, which took one year uh, to report. Uh, now, the question here is, was news slow somehow 100 years ago? Or how fast or how slow was it? Um, so how long would you think it would take for, for the news about the Titanic sinking in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean uh, to reach the world, right? to reach the world, world audience? Well, of course, we have to consider that there was infrastructure already in place here at that time. There was none at the South Pole, so uh, it, it couldn't be news because it was not known. Uh, but with the Titanic, it was, it was different, as I'm going to show in the next few slides. Now, let's look at the Titanic's travels, physical and mediated. Now, this map shows you uh, Titanic leaving Southampton, making a couple of stops, and then ending up, well, not in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but much closer to the uh, American coast. Okay, now this ship here is the Carpathia, which picked up the radioed signals, uh, uh, SOS signals from the Titanic, and uh, which was in the vicinity, and uh, it uh, went to uh, the place of the sinking and it saved uh, hundreds of uh, passengers. So this is the crucial, crucial ship. This is the crucial link, um, the wireless transmission from Titanic to Carpathia. Now, what happens next is Carpathia is communicating um, to Halifax. Halifax is connected to cable uh, by cable to New York. The news travels to London, and then it travels off the map, right, which is where, where I am located in the center of Europe, uh, and anywhere else across Europe, right? So there would be multiple, multiple arrows uh, here. Now, so imagine Prague, the Czech Republic, which was Austria at that time, right? Uh, so the location has not changed, but there was another kind of a transformation. It's seven o'clock in the morning on the 15th of April, the Titanic sinks. Now, already in the evening, in the evening news, there is a brief mention of the Titanic disaster on the very same day. So the news travels, you know, Halifax, New York, London, uh, Prague by wire, and uh, it's known, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's publicized. Um, now, the, the screenshot uh, in the upper right-hand corner uh, shows you a report from the next day um, uh, where, you know, you have reports from the different locations, from Halifax, from New York, from Berlin, from Paris, um, and so on. This is the fact-collecting approach, uh, well, that they're collect collating what they got via the telegraph from these locations. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, it took only uh, three days for the Carpathia to um, deliver its passengers to New York. So the passengers are stepping off and uh, there's already humor uh, about the Titanic. People are already joking and it's finding its way into newspaper articles. Right? This is an interesting aspect of disaster humor, but uh, I don't want to pursue that here. Right. So after these preliminaries, um, let me concentrate now on uh, the next part, and that is the transformation of news in the internet age. Um, I'm going to go over uh, three, uh, three um, zones or three types of uh, online, online reporting and note the transformations, the changes between the three types. The first of these uh, online news, types of online news, I call it online news 100, um, is uh, the second half of the 1990s when uh, many newspapers, many traditional newspapers went online and they established um, website, website pages um, giving their articles. 
Now, what characterizes this stage is very static content. The, the articles were just copies of what appeared in the printed newspapers. And so this was just an electronic version of print news, right? Uh, you might also see it here at the top. Uh, this is from the Telegraph, uh, and the Telegraph calls itself here the electronic Telegraph. Um, the stories were presented in a very linear manner, one after the other. Um, so they were sequential. Um, down here at the bottom, this is from 1997, you can even see, you know, what the next report is. So it's an unrelated story, but it's as if you're reading through a newspaper, a printed version of a newspaper, you turn the page and there's something new, so they take you to the next story. This is a feature that, of course, has completely uh, disappeared. Uh, but you had these, these arrows where you could go from one unrelated story uh, to another as if you were um, browsing a paper. Now, of course, this was groundbreaking uh, for its uh, for its time because this this opened up uh, the world of intertextuality. Right, uh, the internal in link was uh, was uh, was invented. So if we look at the at the, at the picture here on the right, uh, we see you know that texts could be interlinked with one another in the same journal uh, in the same newspaper issue in the current issue ending up with a clear article cluster, right? But they could also uh, relate to previous earlier texts, right? They couldn't uh, uh, relate to future texts, that, that, that's not possible. So that, that's just a backward, backward reference. Um, so syn syn from a synchronic point of view, right, synchronic, uh, you get these clusters from the diachronic, you get um, intertextual, an intertextual network. Um, if you want to see what this can give rise to is sort of a news super text. This is one news story that uh, I tracked uh, in 1997 um, back through the individual links, uh, um, the internal links. Um, and so this, this, this shows you, you know, the pattern of navigation where you can go. Uh, in terms of uh, the individual articles. Each bubble here is one article, each line shows you a connection, and the arrow shows you what is connecting to, to what. And there are also some external links in the chart in case you're wondering why some of them are uh, ending in, um, in mid-space. Mid um, so uh, we end up with a textual network that is easily navigable, uh, but that is that is very unidirectional. Uh, also, what appears out of this uh, um, is that not all articles, not all news, are equally important. So um, they have relevance, uh, relative relative relevance. Right? We could identify three types of articles here: a hub article, a key article, and a pendant article. Right? A pendant article is the easiest. Right, it just you know provides background information, and it does not participate. It's not referred to. It does not participate in this intertextual network of, of file texts. Um, key article uh, gets uh, referred to uh, a lot, right? Uh, but uh, this is a matter of actually the subsequent development uh, um, of future references to this particular text. So you don't know at the time of publication, uh, which, which text may become a key article, okay? A hub article has a more central role in the, in the network. Um, now, this issue also shows, you know, that some articles, you know, develop their relative importance later on, only in the future, right? So they are a dormant in a, in a sense. And here I thought, you know, perhaps of, uh, uh, you are working on various other fields, um, what is the relevance of this kind of a conceptualization of text, textual networks uh, for you? you know, for instance, the area of academic uh, discourse, uh, where we increasingly see, you know, that the things are clickable. Um, there is network intertextuality. You know, citation analysis uh, works with uh, very similar concepts. 
indicating which texts, uh, which scholars are central, crucial. Um, but also, you know, the dormancy is, is, is uh, found here in the case of the late discovery of some important paper, which does not um, make it strong at its time. And, uh, um, you know, is rediscovered 20 years later on, and then everybody refers to, everybody refers to that. Um, so um, there are transformations here. Now, let's move on to online news 200. That is 2000, uh, roughly 2000 and until now. Uh, this is the this is what we all know, right? The constant updating of content. We get news clusters. We get multimodality. Uh, so here in this sample article, you, you have uh, links to videos, for instance. Um, there's extensive hyperlinking, which is internal as well as external. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, the text can be changed. So it's not static any longer. Uh, it's uh, fluid in a sense, right? If you look at the Guardian text here on the right, it tells you the publication date, but also when the text was amended, uh, when changes were made to it. So the article has its own history. It's not a one-off that is written and released uh, out there. Um, of course, discussion forms are attached, the readers participate, participate. There are interactional features, um, sometimes between journalists and audience, but you can remediate the, uh, the text by various uh, social networks. Uh, so um, there are diverse part participatory forms in place to enable remediation and sharing. So um, this uh, uh, sums up what the online news that we all uh, now know um, are like. Very often they are non-linear. The content is broken into textual and visual elements. Um, so you don't get a full page of text, but there are various, you know, it's, it's three or four paragraphs, and then you get links, then you get a video, and then the text continues. Uh, clustering is very strong. News topic is presented as a cluster of dynamic, related, and hierarchically structured text. So these are more important than others. Um, I've put a question mark here on the permanence uh, because the fluidity of the text and the, the, the possible changeability um, also underlies another problem, and that is the fact that you know texts sometimes disappear and they may be removed from um, online uh, news archives um, based upon the, the request of some um, social actor, for instance. Um, and news here, thanks to hypertextual linking, exists as an intertextual network of multimodal artifacts, you could say journalistic and non-journalistic, and participatory uh, practices. Okay, now let me move on to the third generation of text, or the third type of uh, trans transformation, uh, which has affected uh, news texts in the internet era. And this is something that we see increasingly after 2010, and that's a rule as well. But not for all, all articles, this is just for a few, uh, few articles uh, each day uh, in a given, given paper. This is the situation when we either have responsive content or live coverage. Now, this in this case, journalism um, actually gives us a process. It's not delivering a finished uh, product, right? Uh, it's text that is open. It's not even fluid, right? It's open. Uh, it's being produced uh, on the go. Uh, and we do have audience co presence here audience co-participation, and to a certain extent, even audience co-authorship, because the audience can contribute some material in real time, and they can have their content um, incorporated in the, um, in the media master, master text that is uh, developing, that is being written in front of their eyes. Now, so let me look at some of the textual innovations of the brought about by the third type. 
by live news. Right? Of course, we know it's the rolling coverage, the typical, uh, the typical uh, kind of characteristic feature are timestamped uh, posts. These are micro updates on some macro topic. Um, typically, there is reverse chronology, so you'll, you will find the oldest uh, posts uh, at the bottom um, and the, you know, the, the page gets automatically refreshed. So you are supplied with content uh, all, the, all the time. Very often, this concerns events that have a limited duration, um, for instance, sports events, uh, state, state visits, but also um, processes or events that um, are ongoing, like the COVID, COVID crisis, COVID pandemic, right? This is run um, in the newspapers on the basis of live, live coverage, where you get these incremental posts and updates on what is going on in this macro, macro topic. Uh, very often, uh, multimodal content is present and content is embedded from other uh, media media sources. Now, uh, the slide here shows um, one typical feature here, and that is the aggregation of diverse content. So, what live live news does, it does not, as I said, present a journalistic product, but uh, the process. Right? It's the um, you could say it resembles the fact-collecting approach of the 19th century uh, newspapers, which were grabbing pieces of information from here and there and putting it onto the pages. And this is what we actually do have in live live text. Uh, and in the first uh, uh, example, uh, we have a link here to a radio interview uh, to supply more information. And in uh, uh, the second one, which is a, a live text commentary on um, uh, weather phenomenon in the United Kingdom, um, we get these uh, these tweets uh, from uh, TV personalities, uh, and uh, you know this could be lay people, ordinary people um, as well, who provide some kind of a box populi, some kind of a commentary. Some kind of an in, notice the informality of the language, right? How suddenly the register uh, shifts from the impersonal voice of the uh, newspaper to the very personal uh, and personalized uh, comments of someone from out there who offers their opinion on this matter with the with the picture, of course. So it's the aggregation that's coming from all. Now, another typical feature here is the solicitation uh, to participate. These are posts that actually ask people to, to contribute, you know, get involved, join the debate, um, share your views on Twitter, links or telephone numbers uh, for texting are provided. So the, the text actively goes out to um, engage and involve the, uh, the reader. Uh, Smith and Higgins, when they uh, describe liveness, um, describe the situation in a very nice way. They talk about the fluid temporal zone, and they they say that, you know, what we get is the experientiality and spontaneity inherent in the assemblage of an online news feed. You know, the unfolding events are presented as a series of interpretative moments and coherence gives way to some sense of confusion, changeability and dynamism of the conflict. Um, and that's that's very important for us as recipients because we don't know what the outcome of this macro event is. Uh, you know, maybe there will be another update 10 minutes uh, from now uh, that will change the course of the whole, the whole issue. Um, and I think this is a brilliant comment from the same authors that such journalism, what such as journalism shows is the confusion and conflict involved in news gathering itself. The reader is invited to behold and even participate in the processes of making. Now, a few more examples of the transformation of the internal transformation of uh, live pages. 
Um, this, these are uh, Czech live text commentaries from the refugee crisis a few years ago, and it's one and the same um, live text, okay, which uh, I screen grabbed at different times. Now, what we see is obviously the headlines are changing. Right? So the headline is not a static form any longer in a, in a live text, uh, it's changeable. The photographs are changing as well. So the next time you come uh, to this uh, live news site in two hours, perhaps, it will be somewhat different. You will not be reading, you will not feel you are reading old news. And there are even subtle changes to the, um, the, to the text. This is a summary paragraph which starts in the actual live commentary is a little bit below. Now, we have these uh, time-stamped uh, posts uh, in which um, new structures potentially are emerging. Um, this is in check again. It doesn't matter because what, what you need to see here is the use of uh, the bold print, right? The, the journalists are indicating what is important, what is the what is the crucial part of the quote, and they extensively used bold to highlight the relevant information, uh, which they don't do just in the in the in the in the text, but also at the beginning with the initial sentences, which start resembling headlines. Um, in fact. Uh, there is a trend for the emergence of headlined posts in live text uh, commentary that somehow summarize the content of the um, of the update of the post at given given time. This is done by means of general head headings or lifted quotations, a very frequent and common strategy for headlines, as well as traditional summarizing uh, headlines. Now, the final feature that we get here is actually the emergence of structured posts, uh, which are timestamped. So here we see 1614 right, is, is, is the time. Underneath, we get uh, something that is starting to resemble a headline. And then maybe the, the maybe it's something that could be labeled as, as the lead. Uh, with the rest of the body, uh, with the rest of the post uh, constituting a body copy. Um, so, excuse me, Sam, you've got 10 minutes. Sorry. Yes. You've got yes. 10 minutes. Uh, so, here uh, you actually, we actually see that, that within the post, um, we get the emergence, the development of a sort of a self contained uh, news story uh, in its. Right. We have to bear in mind that the live page um, collects uh, mater various material. Uh, it frames diverse content that uh, that is presented as part of a uh, macro macro story. Okay, but it's different from full stories, uh, which tend to be um, very well hyperlinked and that they they are independent. Okay, so moving on to uh, to my uh, my conclusions. Uh, some of the linguistic features of uh, uh, the new genre of live news text, right? They are text because they are written, but they are live because they are, we get this confluence, this temporal co-presence between the event, uh, the, um, the report, the production of the report and the consumption of the text. Um, so these are some of the, some of the features. Uh, the main headline um, is getting new functions. Right, it can serve for the update on the uh, on the event. The main visual gets transformed. Uh, um, more is happening here than just incrementally adding adding information. There are some elements which are non-permanent uh, that are transient. Headlines, structured posts uh, appear. Um, there's some some hedging uh, involved. Uh, March modality plays a role. So. Uh, to conclude, uh, what, what kinds of transformations uh, we have, we have been witnessing um, in the area of 
of uh, news news reporting. Um, certainly, uh, journalists, right, on the part of the journalistic profession, on the production side, and it's not just clothing, right, it's the entire production process. The news texts uh, have changed uh, linguistically, structurally, and so on. So the product has changed. The audience has changed um, on the reception side because they can participate, they can be co-authors. Um, so the question then remains, what has remained uh, stable here over uh, the 100 years uh, or 200 years uh, or 500 years of uh, journalism, uh, depending on uh, which kind of a dimension you, you, you take, if it's uh, Bell or if it's The Guardian or if it's the entire history of journalism. Uh, well, the function of the news text um, uh, seems to have remained the same. That is to bring information, relevant information, up-to-date information. But at the same time, we have to bear in mind that this is no longer the case in print journalism because print journalism is dated. Whatever it's printed in, in the paper is yesterday's news. And uh, since uh, since the competition with, with the internet, you know, the internet wins the game. So we have to add one more transformation in my view. The medium has transformed, the medium has changed. Uh, that is print to online. And once we accept that as a, a possible transformation, then we can see that this is done in order to preserve uh, uh, the uh, the function. That is uh, uh, information provision. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there are some differences here. And my expression of thanks for your patience. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Jan, for your interesting talk and very timely considering um, drastic changes that are taking place in the in, in genres and, and the online transference from printed to online. Um, I'm sure there are some questions uh, that we can uh, ask. And you can type your questions in, in the chat facility if you want. Um, personally, I I have been interested in, interested in in your in that topic for for quite a while, in, in starting from that classification by Shepherd and Waters about, you know, uh, autonomous uh, genres or imported genres from from the printed um, uh, version. What I am actually concerned with is how um, sustained communication practices on the internet. Uh, made into certain affordances of the interfaces are creating a certain processing patterns that at the same time uh, have an impact in the cognitive resources that uh, internet users have at their disposal for, uh, uh, for reading the news. So that alters eventually what counts as relevant in a piece of news. So what do you think about that? That's that's a very interesting, interesting question. Um, and I think there is uh, there is much, much, much truth uh, to that. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by online comments, online commenting. And uh, um, it seems to me that this this practice is uh, uh, you know very important for the uh, for the readers. Um, and it's two two kinds of commenters. It's commenters who comment, and it's commenters or you know just participants. It's just the readers of the comments. So it's the lurkers who don't contribute mm -hmm. but That's read. True. And there may be you know several times many more than than the actual contributors. So yeah, okay, you could think about it. You know the the, the media actually right the, the affordances of the media. Uh, create different kinds of expectations for the readers that readers don't go uh, some readers don't go there for the uh, for the information to get information but they go there mm -hmm. uh, for self expression because suddenly they have this space where they can delimit themselves uh, um, in contrast to the article in contrast to the ideology of the paper in contrast to the government steps, which are which are mentioned there, so this is a venue for uh, which uh, which they are waiting for. Right, someone gives them the chance, and you know they they have the voice. They are given the voice, or they feel that their voice is heard. Um, and uh, for the others, 
you know, the other people, the, the lurkers, they're reading, they're processing this, and they're seeing what the opinions in the community are about a particular issue. Okay, we could, okay, right, if you're reading a particular newspaper, um, that you're in an echo bubble, you know what kinds of opinions you can, you can expect, right? So mm -hmm. it's not definitely representative or majority opinion or something, right? It's just particular, and it's just particular vocal individuals uh, who are expressing themselves, who, who, you, who you, you see that. Uh, but what I'm what I'm seeing very often in some British newspapers, for instance, right? I've been in, interested in 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 the tabloid newspapers. So in the in the Daily Mail, for instance, you get lots of users who actually into the comments. Uh, I go straight for the comments. You know, a great topic, a great headline, and I'm off into the comments. Right. Mm -hmm. So it seems that yes, the affordances are actually. Uh, you know, just as you are saying, um, impacting the cognitive resources of the users about what to expect and what, what they are actually doing with the media. So the media text becomes, I think, some kind of a prompt, right? Some kind of an excuse for maybe mm -hmm. social work between them, uh, you know, or expression of anger. Non-propositional effects. Non-propositional or, you know, hate speech, all of this you know, mm -hmm. activity um, on the side. Mm -hmm. One, one we, we don't have much time. We Just one last question by Professor Sanchez Fajardo. He says, is it possible to claim that the deictic center, basically event, text production, text reception, might have moved into a different pattern, namely event, text production, text reception, or reception production in computer mediated communication? Uh, yes, that's, 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 that's plausible. Yes. Yes. I think we have some really interesting phenomena here in terms of the, um, compression, compression of, uh, of, of time, right? That, mm. you know, you as the, as the recipient, um, are actually brought by the, the textual production of the journalist, uh, to the set, to the moment of, of occurrence. Um, and I think this is the this is the journalistic dream that has been that has been achieved uh, through this this confluence of these data experts. Yes, I think that's that's mm -hmm. definitely valid. And finally, the last one by uh, Professor Ort uh, Jopis. Um, she wants to know whether there is any difference between quality press and tabloid and other, let's say, dirty digital news publications in terms of you know what you're saying about it. In terms of live. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely, yes. Uh, if it's of interest, I can, uh, you know, answer this in connection with sports commentaries that I um, researched uh, ex extensively. And uh, uh, this, uh, this, 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 this phenomenon, for instance, in in, in the tabloids. Um, live live text commentary, you know, describing the sports event every minute, what is happening in the in in the pitch, you know, how who scored a goal, who went where, who passed. Um, interestingly enough, in the in in the tabloids, um, um, I did this study on material from from some ten years ago. The tabloids were really descriptive, um, whereas the the quality papers. Uh, were very opinionated, and I did my uh, my study on the Guardian newspaper, which caters to a sophisticated uh, uh, audience, and um, the audience could co-participate in the in the text emails to the um, uh, sports commentator who was writing the the live commentary. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, you could see the degree of sophistication in the in the comments, for instance, when they were involved in joking. They were using Latin-based uh, Latin-based jokes you know, as kind of kind of kind of winks at the in-groupness, at the exclusivity of the of the of the group, but also laughing at themselves. Uh, so th this 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 was an interesting uh, difference which I noticed between these two media in that particular sound that I that I analyzed. Okay, so no time for more questions. Sorry about that. Many thanks, Jan, for your uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it a lot, and I hope you stick with us for some of the rest uh, papers and, and lectures that are um, programmed for today. 
So thank you, Jen. I hope to see you again soon, essentially, you know, in, in person. And, and thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice conference.